The theme of uh, our conference tonight is Archbishop Lefebvre and the Conciliar Popes. And I have uh, divided my uh, lecture in four parts. First of all, I would speak to you about St. Peter and his ministry, ministry of the Pope. In the second part, we would see the uh, attitude of Archbishop Lefebvre towards the Conciliar Popes. In the third part, we will ask ourselves if these conciliar popes are true popes. In the fourth part, we would uh, draw some conclusions and have a look on the future. So, first of all, I wanted to see together with you the person and the ministry of Peter. You know that he was a fisherman from the lake of Genezareth, together with his uh, brother Andrew, who one day brought him to our Lord Jesus Christ, who in this moment was looking profoundly on him, saying, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. From now on you will be called Cephas. Cephas means Peter, and Peter means the rock. Now we know very well that in the Holy Scripture, when God imposes a new man to a person, he uh, entrusts a special mission to this person, which is always linked with this name. So if he calls Simon, the son of Jonas, Peter, the rock, this means that later on he would establish him to be the rock of his church. Peter is a very special position among the twelve apostles. He uh, has always the first place in all the lists of the apostles in the New Testament. And one day our Lord orders him to pay the taxes for him, Jesus, and for him, Peter, together. So there is a certain identification our Lord makes with Peter. Moreover, we see him go, we see our Lord go to the house of Peter and heal the mother-in-law of him, of a sickness. And one day he preaches out of the boat of Peter to the multitude. We do not read in the gospel that our Lord has preached from the boat, from the ship of an other apostle. Now you know very well that this ship means the church. It's a symbol of the church. And so our Lord Jesus Christ preaches only uniquely out from the boat of Peter, that's to say from the church of Peter. He does not preach out from another church. And in fact, our Lord, one day coming to the quarters of Caesarea Philippi, asked his apostles, for whom men are taking him? And they said, one, one they take you for uh, John the Baptist, other for uh, Elias, other for Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he asked, but you, for whom do you take me? And it is Peter who now in the name of the twelve answers, giving a wonderful confession of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Let us see this uh, little paragraph in the uh, 16th chapter of the uh, Gospel of St. Matthew. And Jesus came into the quarters of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? They, but they said, some John the Baptist, and others Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. She says to them, But whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And she's answering, said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bariona, son of Jonas. Because flesh and blood has not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. So, what you have confessed is given, you were inspired in this uh, confession of my divinity, 
you have said that I am the son of the living God and you are right. Now I also will tell you who are you. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, that's to say the rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. So our Lord promises to Peter to, uh, that one day he will give him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He not yet gives him the keys uh, now in this moment, but he promises that later on he will do, he would do so. And just before his passion, our Lord has prayed in a very special manner for Peter, which we do not read in the gospel that he has done for another apostle. It is related to us in St. Luke chapter 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Our Lord has prayed that the faith of Peter fail not. Now our Lord is praised as a man. Our Lord is God, but he's in the same way is a man. And he prays as man in his human nature, and but his prayer will always be heard by the Father. It is infallibly heard. So the faith of Peter will not fail because our Lord has prayed for him. And nevertheless, our Lord adds a very mysterious word. He says, and now being once converted, confirm thy brethren. So, there, if our Lord speaks about a conversion, it means that, our, that Peter one day might know a certain meekness or may one day or one moment be not so faithful as he should. Once you are converted, then confirm thy brethren. That will be his task. So, after the resurrection of our Lord, his passion and his resurrection, he meets in a very special manner once again Peter at this lake of Genezareth. He meets uh, some of his apostles who have uh, uh, caught fishes. We will tell hear about this uh, scenario a little bit later. And after he has uh, taken a breakfast with them, then he addresses himself to Peter asking him three times about his love. We read this in the Gospel of St. John, tw chapter 21. Jesus says uh, to Simon Peter, Peter, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? He says to him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love thee. He says to him, Feed my lambs. And he says to him, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? He says to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says to him, Feed my lambs. He says to him the third time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Lovest thou me? So Peter realizes that our Lord makes him make reparation for his triple denial in the night of, con uh, of the Passion by this triple confession of his love. And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, feed my sheep. So in this moment, our Lord institutes him to be the supreme shepherd of his lambs, that's to say of the normal faithful, and of his sheep, the mother sheep, that's to say the shepherds, the priests, the bishops. He institutes him really to be his vicar on earth have the supreme power in the uh, kingdom of heaven. Now, St. Peter is a man with wonderful characteristics. He is a man full of uh, faithfulness, a man with an enormous devotion, 
a man with a profound faith, a man full of charity and of love for his divine master. A charity and a love which goes so far that he says, if all the others, he says, will flee, I will stay with you. And I will even go to prison with you and I am ready to die, to shed my blood with you and for you. So Peter has absolutely wonderful characteristics. Nevertheless, we must admit that Peter has also some weaknesses which appear clearly in the gospel. The first weakness which appears is just after our Lord in the quarters of Caesarea Philippi has promised to Peter that he would hand him over the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Just in this moment afterwards, our Lord announces that he will go to his passion. Let us see what uh, our Lord says to his disciples in this moment. From that time, Jesus began to show his, to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the ancients and scribes and chief priests and be put to death and the third day rise again. So our Lord announces him that now the time has come to fulfill the mission of his father and to die in a great pain on a, on a cross. And Peter, taking him, began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, be it far from thee, this shall not be unto thee. So Peter wants him to hinder, wants to hinder him to fulfill the mission the Father has entrusted to him. Why? Because he expects a temporal redeemer, a earthly messiahs, a messiah who would be a social reformer, a political leader who would drive out the, Jew, uh, the, the Romans from Palestine and establish the Jews to be the ruling nation in the world. This was the general expectance of the uh, contemporaries of uh, Peter, of the Jews of the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. Generally speaking, they expected a temporal messiah. Only very few expected a spiritual, moral, a religious messiahs. And Peter is so a victim of the uh, opinion of his time. And he wants so to hinder our Lord to go to his passion. Now let's hear what our Lord, how our Lord reacts. We will be astonished. Who turning, Jesus, taking, said to Peter, go behind me, Satan. Thou art a scandal unto me, because thou savest not the things that are of God, but the things that are of man. Is it understandable that our Lord calls his first pope a Satan? Well, it's a fact. It's like this. He calls him a Satan. And why? Because he says, thou savest not the things of God, but the sa thou savest the things of man. So we have a completely false expectance about the uh, Messiah to come. That's the reason why he calls him a Satan. Very severe, very severe, uh, severe rebuke, uh, rebuke, uh, rebuke. Now, in the night of the Passion, once again, we see a certain weakness of Peter. Already in the garden, where he was taken after the uh, institution of the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood in the synagogue. He was taken together with two other apostles, with John and uh, the apostle whom Jesus loved, and with James, who would be the first um, uh, uh, martyr among, uh, among the apostles. So our Lord took these three apostles with him in the garden, and he told them, Vigilate torate, be awake and pray. And then he goes himself to pray, to fall on his face and to pray. And he comes back, and what does he see? They are sleeping. Who is sleeping? Peter, the Pope, John, and James, the bishops. The Pope and the bishops, they sleep. And our Lord is awake and prays. So, once again he goes there, and once again he comes back, and he finds him once again asleep. And... Uh, then, one other, 
is awake, that is uh, Judas. And he comes with the servants of the high priests, and they arrest our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this moment, Peter takes his sword and uh, uh, strikes the, uh, the servant of the high priest and cuts him an ear. Uh, our Lord rebukes him, and saying, well, now is not the time to resolve the problems with power. You should have resolved them by being awake and pray. I told you this. Now it's too late. And uh, so our Lord is arrested. And it is said in the Holy Scripture, in this moment, all fleet. Who? Well, Peter and the other apostles. So the, the Pope and the bishops, they fleet. Why? Because they were full of fear. They, uh, they feared to be also arrested. They followed some of them with a certain distance. Our Lord was led to Annas and Caiaphas. And uh, Peter followed and finally entered in the yard and was standing with the servants of the high priest uh, around a fire because it was cold, says the Holy Scripture. And uh, after a certain moment, a hand may, uh, made addresses herself to Peter and said, uh, you are also one of his disciples. And he denies, I have nothing to do with this man. I do not know what you are speaking about. And after a certain, uh, certain time, a, sec a second hand maid addressed herself to Peter. Yes, you are also one of uh, this because your language is revealing you to be a, 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 from Galilee. And he denies once again. And after a certain moment, those who are standing around with Peter, they say, yes, we saw you in the, in the garden. And he begins to blaspheme and to curse and say, I have nothing to do with this man. So three times he denies his beloved master. Why? Because he's full of fear. Just some hours before in the cynical, he had still uh, assured that he would be ready to go to prison, to die, to shed his blood. Now all has come. These are the weaknesses of Peter. Now, one could uh, say that uh, these weaknesses are understandable because they are before the coming of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost. Uh, and uh, uh, by this fact, the apostles were confirmed in sanctifying grace. They could no longer commit any mortal sin. Nevertheless, even after Pentecost, we still see certain little weaknesses of Peter. And one is related to us in the uh, epistle to the Galatians. So related to us by St. Paul. What happened? The early church, my dear brethren, was composed by two elements. The converted Jews who were baptized and the converted Gentiles who also were baptized. And the converted Jews had a certain despise for the converted Gentiles saying, these are Christians of second class. We are first class. And the apostles had to gather in Jerusalem to, uh, to discuss the question and they decided that the Gentiles, the converted Gentiles, are of the same dignity as the converted Jews. Nevertheless, some of these very zealous Jews continued in their opinion. And so, one day, Peter is in Antioch, and uh, he has uh, communion with the converted Jews and the converted Gentiles. But then some of James, who is the bishop of Jerusalem, and in whose uh, surrounder are these very zealous Jews, come, came to Antioch. And Peter withdraw from the communion with the converted Gentiles. Let's see what St. Paul says us in the epistle to the Galatians, chapter 2. But when Cephas was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Now, who is Paul? Paul is an apostle. Paul is a bishop. Who is Peter? The Pope. So, there is a bishop who withstands the Pope in the face. And why? Because, he says, he was to be blamed. 
And why is he to be blamed? Well, he explains. For before that some came from James, he had eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them who were of the circumcision. And to his dissimulation, the rest of the Jews consented, so that Barnabas also was led by them into that dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly unto the truth of the gospel, a very severe reproach. They did not walk uprightly to the truth of the gospel. That is what St. Paul, the bishop, says concerning Peter the Pope. I said to save us before them all, so publicly he uh, rebukes him. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews do, how dost thou compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now, <clears throat> there is still another event after the resurrection of our Lord, where we see that uh, Peter was not always in the attitude and position he should be. What happened? Peter one day said, I will go fishing. And some of the other uh, apostles also went with him. Altogether, there were seven. And they went, they went so to the Sea of Genezaret. And it is said that in that night they caught nothing. Absolutely nothing. It is told to us in the 21st chapter of the Apostle, of the Epistle, of the uh, uh, Gospel of St. John. And many more, and they went forth and entered into the ship, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was come, Jesus stood at the shore, yet the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So they did not recognize him. Jesus therefore said to him, Children, have you any meat? They answered, No. He says to them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. So, before they have caught nothing, now the whole net is full, full of big fish. Well, everybody understands, now that is a miracle. But Peter does not understand. Peter does not understand. <laughs> that disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. So Peter did not realize. John realized. John, the disciple of the love, he realized that this was Jesus. Simon Peter, when he heard that it was the Lord, girt his coat about, uh, about him, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea in order to be more quickly to uh, meet our Lord. So, let us draw the conclusion of this uh, event. There might be situations in the church where there is such a confusion that Peter, the Pope, no longer recognizes our Lord. That another bishop, because John is the bishop who makes him aware, Dominus est, that another bishop must tell him it is the Lord. That's to say, not Buddha is God, and not uh, Allah, and not Mohammed is a pro prophet sent in the world, but Dominus as it is the Lord, it is Jesus Christ. Not Assisi meetings will bring uh, peace on earth, but the one who is called the Prince of Peace, God made man, our Lord himself, nobody else. Dominus est. Dominus est. So there might be situations where a bishop has to tell this to the Pope, because the Pope himself, he does not recognize any longer our Lord. Let's see further the life of Peter. He uh, establishes a local church in Antioch, then in Rome, where he comes, and uh, then he dies there in Rome as a martyr, being crucified with the head downwards. So, he is the first bishop of Rome, and there in Rome he dies. And this means 
that all the, his successors as bishops of Rome are automatically taking over his task to be the supreme shepherds of the whole flock, of the universal flock, of the church. That's to say that always the bishop of Rome will be the pope, will be the vicar of Christ, always, and nobody else. This is a divine institution because Peter has died in Rome, has shed his blood, has uh, made fertile the Roman earth by his blood and has established there the seed, the apostolic seed. And so the Roman church, as a local church, always has a very important uh, role uh, regarding the universal church. The Roman church, as a local church, is called Mater et Magistra, Omnium Ecclesiarum. Mother and mistress of all the churches, local churches of the whole universe. Now this um, makes us understand that our Catholic faith and our Catholic religion is bound to Rome. That Rome has a providential role in our religion. And Archbishop Lefebvre, in his spiritual journey, uh, at the end, speaks about the spirit of Romanitas, the spirit of uh, Romanity. He uh, says the following, very nice uh, explanations. It gives there. I believe I must add some words to draw the attention of our priests and our seminarians to the indisputable fact of the Roman influences on our spirituality, on our liturgy, and even on our theology. One cannot deny that it is a providential fact. God, who leads all things, has in his infinite wisdom prepared Rome to become the seat of Peter and center for the radiation of the gospel. Hence the adage, on the Christo Evo Romano. To be a Christian means to be a Roman. Don Granger, in his history of St. Cecil, recounts, recounts the great part which members of great Roman families played in the foundation of the church, giving their goods and their blood for the victory and uh, the reign of Jesus Christ. Our Roman liturgy is the faithful witness of this. Romanitas is not a vain word. The Latin language is an important example. It has brought the expression of the faith and of Catholic worship to the ends of the world. And the converted people are proud to sing their faith in this language, a real symbol of the unity of the Catholic faith. Schismas and heresies are often begun by a rupture with Romanitas, a rupture with the Roman liturgy, with Latin, with the theology of the Latin and Roman fathers and theologians. It is this force of the Catholic faith rooted in Romanitas that Freemasonry wished to eliminate by occupying the pontifical states and enclosing Catholic Rome in Vatican City. This occupation of Rome by the Masons permitted infiltration of the Church by modernism and the destruction of Catholic Rome by modernist clergy and popes who hastened to destroy every vestige of Romanitas, the Latin language, the Roman liturgy. The Slavic Pope, John Paul II, is the most determined to change the little which was kept by the Lateran Treaty and the Concordate. Rome is no longer a sacred city. He encourages the establishing of false religions in Rome itself, accomplishing their scandalous uh, ecumenical meetings. He everywhere pushes for the inculturation in the liturgy, destroying the last vestiges of the Roman liturgy. He has modified in practice <clears throat> the statutes of the Vatican State. He has renounced coronation, thus refusing to be a head of state. This relentlessness against Romanitas is an in infallible sign of rupture with the Catholic faith that he no longer defends. The Roman pontifical universi uh, universities have become chairs of modernist pestilence. The co-education of the Gregorian is a perpetual scandal. All must be restored in Domino, in Christo Domino, in Christ the Lord, in Rome as elsewhere. Let us love to see how the ways of divine providence and wisdom pass by Rome. 
We will conclude that one cannot be Catholic without being Roman. This applies also to Catholics who have neither the Latin language nor the Roman liturgy. If they remain Catholic, it is because they remain Roman, like the Maronites, for example, by the ties to the Catholic and Roman French culture which formed them. God willed that Christianity, cast in a certain way in the Roman mold, receive from it a vigorous and exceptional expansion. All is grace in the divine plan, and our divine Savior disposes all, as the Romans are said to act, that is, concilio et patientia, or suaviter et fortiter, with counsel and patience, sweetly and mightily. Ours is the duty to guard this Roman tradition desired by our Lord, as he wished us to have Mary as our mother. So, this is uh, some explanations concerning uh, the importance of Rome and the spirit of Romanitas. Now, <clears throat> let us still explain that uh, the Pope being the Bishop of Rome, is elected by the Roman clergy because the cardinals are, in a certain way, the uh, parish priests of Rome. Every cardinal has there his title church. And so, as it is uh, always the use that normally the clergy elects its bishop, so they elect the bishop of Rome. And so, being elected the bishop of Rome, he becomes automatically the Pope, the successor of Peter and the Vicar of Christ. That's important that you see this. Now, Peter himself has, after his death, as a successor, Linus. To him succeeds Cletus, then Clemens. All the popes, in an uninterrupted uh, 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 succession, till Benedict the 16th in our days. The 35 first popes all were martyrs, all shed their blood. But even after the church has uh, got its liberty under Constantine the Great, we see wonderful figures, personalities on the sea, on the chair of Peter. So, for example, Leo the Great who drove away from Rome Attila, the king of the Huns. Or, for example, Gregory the Great, who sent St. Augustine with uh, 14 monks to the Anglo-Saxon to convert them, a wonderful shepherd of the universal church. Or Gregory the Seventh, who withstood the uh, German uh, emperor Henry IV in the question of establishing the bishops in, uh, in, uh, in the empire. Or uh, Pius V, the, pap the Pope of uh, Lepanto, the Pope who fought so the Muslims, the Pope of the Holy Rosary, the Pope of our Mass. Pius IX, the Pope of the Immaculate Conception, the Pope of the First Vatican Council, the Pope <coughs> under whom so was uh, given the definition of the uh, infallibility of the Pope and the supreme jurisdiction of the Pope over the whole universal church. Pius X, St. Pius X, who fought the modernists in the church. Pius XII, who fought against the neo-modernists in the church. We see all these wonderful figures, these wonderful persons, great persons, great theologians, uh, uh, very devout shepherds, and there is no doubt that they have got this inheritance from Peter as his successors. Unfortunately, also the one or the other weakness of Peter passed over to the one or the other of his successors. So, for example, in the 10th century, which is called the Seculum Obscurum, the dark century, because very unworthy Popes were elected. They were brought to the seat of Peter by a mighty Roman family. Uh, we see uh, these, uh, this uh, Seculum Oscurum, this dark century, but we see here other things. 
uh, Alexander the Sixth, the Sixth, who was not a very virtuous man, Pope Liberius, who was not very strong in his government. It is the time of the Arian heresies. Arius, who denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, and Saint uh, Athanasius, Bishop of uh, Alexandria, who defended, to the contrary, the divinity of Jesus Christ. And because he was uh, so uh, uh, a good defender, he had to leave his episcopal seat five times. He was expelled. He was uh, put to exile. And an uh, Italian bishop conference influenced by the uh, uh, spirit of the Arians, condemned Athanasius. And Pope Liberius, more or less, was on the side of this Italian bishop conference. So, then later on we till see a more, uh, till more serious case. Hon Pope Honorius, he governs the church from 625 to 638, so in the 7th century. And in this time, there are enormous theological discussions about our Lord, about his two natures. We already mentioned that he is true God and true man, the one and the other, two natures in him, united in the one person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. We call this the hypostatical union. Now, if he is true man, he has also a human will, a human energy. A human will, it, so he has two wills, a divine will and a human will, but the, the, the human will always will be submitted to the divine will completely. Nevertheless, he has a true human will. Now there are heretics who denied this, who said in our Lord there is only one will. They are, they are called the monotelets. Monotelets. Mm -hmm. Telos in Greek is the aim, the goal. So uh, it's the energy. So they said that in our Lord is only one will. And Pope Honorius wrote a letter to one of these heretics and more or less approving him. Now a council, the third council of Constantinople, after the death of Honorius, condemned Honorius for this, saying Honorius is a heretic, and excommunicated him. They said Honorius has to be cut from the communion of the faithful. Pope Leo II, who followed this council, uh, approved it, but not completely. He said, well, Honorius has favored heresy. He did not say he was a heretic, but he has favored heresy. But then he draws also the conclusion that is why he has to be cut from the communion of the faithful. He, so he approves the excommunication after the death. But let it be said very clearly, neither the council nor Pope Leo II say that Honorius was not a pope. They do not uh, dispute this, they do not deny this, but they say they have, at least he has favored heresy. Now, I come to the second point of my lecture tonight, Archbishop of Lefebvre and the uh, Council Popes, the, pope, the Conciliar Popes. You know that Archbishop of Lefebvre received his uh, formation in Rome, in Santa Chiara, in the French seminary in Rome, held by the Holy Ghost Fathers. And the uh, rector of uh, the seminary was in this time Father Lefloc, a very, very devoted man, very devoted to the popes, very devoted in uh, exposing the encyclicals of the popes, explain, explaining them to his seminarians, the uh, uh, the present uh, difficulties in the church, in human society. And uh, in this time, 1927, there was an important event which had uh, enormous consequences. In France, there was uh, founded the Action Française by Charles Maurras. Now, Charles Maurras 
was not a Catholic. He was a good man, but he was not a Catholic. He was a, a, a agnosticist. And he had with his uh, Action Francaise the uh, plan to restore a certain natural order in France against the French Revolution. But the Pope, Pius the, uh, the 11th, feared very much, saying, well, it might be very dangerous because this man is not a Catholic and he might uh, well, lead people uh, in a wrong way. And so he condemned the, fr uh, the Action Francaise. Now, Father Le Floc, the rector of the seminary of Rome, was uh, calumniated to be in the sense that he would be an adept of the Action Francaise. And uh, Pius XI asked that uh, Father Le Floc leaves the seminary, dismisses from his function to be the rector. Now for the Archbishop, as the young seminarian Marcel Lefebvre, this was an enormous uh, pain. Because on the one side, he was very, very devoted to the Pope. On the other side, he loved his rector uh, like a father. And so, well, he was uh, cut in pieces. Nevertheless, his uh, devotion for the Holy See, his uh, spirit of Romanitas, did not suffer in midst of this trial. In 1962, the Pope John XXIII opened the Second Vatican Council. Archbishop Lefebvre was appointed a member of the Central Preparation Commission to work out the schemas which would be treated in the Council. And uh, the Archbishop did its best, together with the other members of this Preparation Commission, to work out good schemas. Nevertheless, he feared for the council, knowing that uh, a lot of liberal spirits are around, that a lot of influence of the world would, uh, would uh, uh, come to the council. And so it happened. Just some days after the opening of the council, there was like a coup d'etat by the liberal forces who managed that all the prepared schemas were put to the uh, garbage and new commissions were established to work out new schemas. And these new commissions were, uh, um, were mainly occupied by liberal theologians, liberal forces. Now the Archbishop himself, together with some other council fathers, uh, founded uh, conservative group called the Cetus Internationalis Patrum, a group to defend the tradition of the church in the council, during the council. Unfortunately, the popes, they were more on the side of the liberals in the council. The Archbishop himself has explained us several times there were perhaps 250 liberal, really convinced and organized liberal council fathers, especially the Rhine Alliance. Rhine Alliance called because they came mainly from the countries around the Rhine, around the Rhine River. So from France, Belgium, Holland, Germany, Austria, and uh, Switzerland. And he said, well, there, there was this group, and there were perhaps the same number of people in, uh, in the Cetus, in the Nationalist Patrum, so conservative uh, council fathers. The other 1,500, 2,000 council fathers, they were not very, very well aware. They did not know very well what was going on. So when they had to decide, they looked on the Pope. And they, uh, they, they uh, asked themselves, what is the attitude of the Pope? How does the Pope want to be uh, that we vote? And when they saw that the Pope was favoring the liberals, well, they voted for the liberals. And so the liberals had finally this, uh, the victory in the council. So the 7th of December, 1965, one day before the closing of the council, 
there was published the Declaration about Religious Liberty. Now, what does this decree, this uh, document contain? What does it say? It does not say, as certain people me, uh, think, it does not say that every man can just choose the religion he wants. This is not true. But this document about religious liberty says that the state, that human society, has to be neutral towards religion. That human society has to uh, recognize that all the religions have a natural right. Have a natural right as long as they do not disturb public order. And this means that all the religions, they can work, expand, make a missionary work in the different countries so the Muslims can uh, build their mosques and, and so on. Everybody has a right. The state so has not the right, never the right, to forbid these religions, the sects and, and so on. Now, you see how much such a uh, declaration is against the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ in human society. Because our Lord is the only one. He is the truth. And only the truth has a right. Error, error never has a right. Only truth has a right. And it is even to a certain extent an implicit, not an explicit, but an implicit attack to the divinity of Jesus Christ in so far as God is God not only in the private sphere, in the individuals, but he is also God everywhere, especially in the public order. So if the state has uh, to recognize that all the religions have a right, a natural right, this means that God in once in the public sphere is no longer God. That there he has no longer the right to be all, uh, uniquely present. That's what it says. So it's a very, very uh, bad and very dangerous and uh, de declaration with a lot of consequences. Because in the name of this document, Religious Liberty, all the Catholic states in the world, especially in South America, also Spain, Italy, were changed in laicistic states. That's to, say, that's to say in states who from this time on recognized all the religions. And all the sects came in and made their work of conversion and uh, so brought people away from the faith. Millions of people have lost the faith because of this document. And the Archbishop himself put the question, but how is it possible that the uh, Pope himself approves of the, such a document? In 1969, there was introduced the Novus Ordo Misse, the new liturgy, which is more Protestant than Catholic, at least very Protestanticizing. And uh, the Archbishop did not accept this new liturgy. He held to the old liturgy, continued to celebrate the old Mass. And once again he asked, how is it possible that the Pope himself approves of such a liturgy? He begins to attack these errors and these new orientations in the Church. He, nevertheless, he is still very reserved in his attacks towards the Pope himself. Very reserved, very discreet. He just uh, says, these things are poison. I don't take care who gives me this poison. I won't take it because it is it brings death to me. So I won't take it. I do not even put the question to me who gives me this poison, but I don't take it. Things change a little bit when in 1974, he has founded the Society of St. Pius X in, in, uh, officially in 1970, so four years later, two prelates come from Rome ordered to make a canonical visit in Econ to examine the seminary. And during this visit, they make very strange statements to themselves about the eternal truth, about 
the uh, physical resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, about the uh, vowel, vowel foundation of the celibacy for the clergy. Very strange statements. And Dartmouth was very upset about this. He went to Rome to protest against this visitation, this visit. And there in Rome itself, he wrote a declaration where he lays down his attitude and his guidelines uh, for the society St. Pius X, for his own action. And this declaration of November the 21st, 974, is still our guideline in our days for our talks with Rome and our contacts with prelates and uh, uh, cardinals. And I wanted to read to you this declaration. We hold fast with all our heart and with uh, all our soul to Catholic Rome, guardian of the Catholic faith and of the traditions necessary to preserve this faith, to eternal Rome, mistress of wisdom and truth. We refuse, on the other hand, and we have always refused to follow the Rome of neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies, which were clearly evident in the Second Vatican Council and after the Council and all the reforms which issued from it. All these reforms indeed have contributed and are still contributing to the destruction of the church, to the ruin of the priesthood, to the abolition of the sacrifice of the ma mass and of the sacraments, to the disappearance of religious life, to a naturalistic, naturalist and Tayardian teaching in universities, seminaries and catechetics, a teaching derived from liberalism and Protestantism, many times condemned by the solemn magisterium of the church. No authority, not even the highest in the hierarchy, you see, he make a very, very discreet uh, allusion, uh, uh, allusion, not even the highest in the hierarchy can force us to abandon or diminish our Catholic faith, so clearly expressed and professed by the church magisterium for 19, 19 centuries. But though we, says St. Paul, or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Is it not this that the Holy Father is repeating to us today? And if we can discern a certain contradiction in his words and deeds, as well as in, the, in those of the dicasteries, well, we choose what was always taught and we turn a deaf ear to the novelties destroying the church. It is impossible to modify profoundly the Lex Orandi, the law of praying, without modifying the Lex Credendi, the law of belief. To the Novus Ordo Misse correspond a new catechism, a new priesthood, new seminaries, a charismatic Pentecostal church, all things opposed to orthodoxy and the perennial teaching of the church. This reformation born of liberalism and modernism is poisoned through and through. It derives from heresy and ends in heresy, even if all its acts are not formally heretical. It is therefore impossible for any conscious and faithful Catholic to espouse this reformation or to submit to it in any way whatsoever. The only attitude of faithfulness to the Church and Catholic doctrine in view of our salvation is a categorical refuse to ac accept this reformation. That is why, without any spirit of rebellion, bitterness or resentment, we pursue our work of forming priests. With the timeless magisterium as our guide, we are persuaded that we can render no greater service to the Holy Catholic Church, to the sovereign pontiff, pontiff and to posterity. That is why we hold fast to all that has been believed and practiced in the faith, morals, liturgy, teaching of the catechism, formation of the priest, and institution of the church by the church of all time. To all these things as codified in those books which saw they before the modernist influence of the council. This we shall do until such time that the true light of tradition dissipates the darkness obscuring the sky of eternal Rome. By doing this, with the grace of God and the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary and that of uh, St. Joseph and St. Pius X, 
we are assured of remaining faithful to the Roman Catholic Church and to all the successors of Peter and of being the faithful dispensers of the mysteries of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Ghost. So these are the words of Archbishop Lefebvre in his uh, historical declaration. Already in this time, there were people who invited the Archbishop to break with Rome, especially Father Denard, from a priest from uh, France. He said, you have to break with this Rome. You have no longer to go to Rome to have any contact with these people. And the Archbishop answered Father Denard, let it be known that if one bishop does not break with Rome, I am this bishop. So he uh, attacks the error, but in the same time he does all to maintain his attachment to Rome. Nevertheless, he suddenly puts the question to him, how is it possible that the popes in such a way favor this new orientation by which the church is to a certain extent destroyed? He suddenly puts this question to him. Paul the six dies the sixth of uh, August, nineteen hundred seventy-eight. The Archbishop doubts one moment about the legitimacy of the election which follows, because the cardinals over eighty years are excluded from the uh, conclave. And the Archbishop says it is a natural right that these cardinals uh, have a voice, have a vote in the conclave. But when he sees then that the whole church, and especially the Roman church, and including the cardinals who were excluded from the conclave, accept this, uh, uh, this vote, accept this uh, new pope, John Paul, uh, the uh, Pope Luciani, well, he has no longer any doubt. He says, well, he is really the Pope. This new Pope, Luciani, Paul, John Paul I, uh, refuses coronation. Moreover, he says that uh, only during the council he has understood religious liberty in another way as he understood it before the council. Before the council, he thought that only truth has a, a, a right. Now he, has under, he understands things in another way. So he has, uh, uh, he has joined this new teaching, this new uh, attitude towards religious liberty. Also, when he was still a cardinal of Venice, the patriarch of Venice, he persecuted the priests who said the old mass. He dies 33 days after his election. And a new pope is elected, the cardinal from uh, Krakowie, Wojtyla, who takes the name John Paul II. And already one month after his election, he receives, cardinal, uh, he receives Archbishop Lefebvre in private, private audience. And he puts three questions to him, which are very characteristic. First question, it is said that you are against the pope. And the Archbishop said, well, I'm not against the Pope at all. Uh, I accept fully the uh, decree of papacy, how it was uh, defined in the First Vatican Council in the decree Pastor Eternus. Fine, the Pope was satisfied. Second point, it is said that you are against the Second Vatican Council. And the Archbishop said, well, I accept the Council interpreted in the light of tradition. And in the mind of the Archbishop, he did not express this, but in the mind of the Archbishop, it was always like this, that tradition is the criterion for the council. What is conform with tradition can stand, can stay. What is ambiguous must be brought to clarification by the light of tradition. What is against tradition has to be eliminated. So, the Pope was satisfied with his declaration, I accept the, uh, the counts in the light of tradition, 
And finally, third question, it is said that you are against the new liturgy. And the Archbishop said, yes, uh, I maintain in all my houses the old liturgy, that is true. Uh, and the Pope says, well, that is not a question of uh, doctrine, it is just a question of discipline. So you will clarify this with Cardinal Shaper, who was the head of the Congregation of uh, Faith in this time. Uh, I will call him immediately, uh, so he telephones Cardinal Shaper, who comes, he was a Croatian, and he comes and he says, oh, very holy father, these people, they make a banner of the old mass. We cannot permit them to uh, celebrate the old mass because they are fighting against the mass we are celebrating. It's impossible. So the Pope says, well, uh, unfortunately, I have no longer time. I have other meetings. Please clarify the question among you. And so he leaves those. And there were then meetings uh, and uh, letters between Colonel Seper and uh, Archbishop Leveva going on till his death in fall 1981. And Colonel Ratzinger, Archbishop from Munich, was appointed to be his successor as head of the Congregation of Faith. This Cardinal Ratzinger had met Archbishop Lefebvre already before he was appointed to Rome, together with other cardinals, because he was uh, worried about the whole situation and he was uh, had uh, a certain care to find a solution. So, when he was appointed head of the Congregation of Faith, he also uh, was... Uh, had the charge to be the intermediary between Archbishop Lefebvre and the society on the one side and the Holy See on the other side. And in this time, so letters were exchanged between him and Archbishop Lefebvre. And the Cardinal always insisted on two points. He said, well, you must recognize the new mass, that it is orthodox, that it is corresponding to the Catholic doctrine. First point. Second point, you must recognize the Second Vatican Council. If you do so, then eventually, possibly, we could consider to give the Mass, the old Mass, free. But these are the conditions. And the Archbishop answers to the first point, well, I recognize that the new Mass, if it's celebrated according to the liturgical books, especially in Latin, with the right intention, it is uh, sacramentally a valid mass, but he did not speak about orthodoxy. Second point concerning the Second Vatican Council, he says, well, there are points which are unacceptable, and the whole council has to have a re revision, has to be reviewed. Now, the cardinal said, well, under these conditions, that goes too far, this cannot be accepted. So, there were all these letters, and it was always, uh, all the letters always took about these two points, the new mass and the, to recognize the council. Now, in 1983, a new canon law was published, and uh, it was nothing else and is nothing else than a trans uh, canonical transcription of the Second Vatican Council and its false principles. So the Archbishop also was very reserved towards the new canon law. In this same year, 83, the Pope himself visited a Protestant church in Rome. This was the first time that the Pope did such a thing. In 1985, Archbishop Lefebvre presented dubias to the Holy See. Dubias means questions, doubts about certain, uh, certain um, positions of the Second Vatican Council, certain decrees of the Second Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, especially religious liberty. How is it possible that Pius IX condemns religious liberty? And all the popes, after, especially after the French Revolution, and then the Second Vatican Council proclaims religious liberty. How is how to reconcile these two things? And he receives a, 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 
uh, answer from Rome, which says that, well, uh, in, uh, in uh, temporal things, there is a certain neutrality. The state uh, does not, cannot recognize which is the true religion. The state cannot recognize which is the true religion. Now, who is the state? The state are the state men, the, the men of the state. Now, the First Vatican Council states very clearly that men can recognize God and can recognize what is the true religion. So the state has the possibility to recognize what is the true religion. So this, is, this answer is absolutely once again against what the church has taught. So the Archbishop was not satisfied at all. He was even very upset. In the year after, 1986, the Pope announced the Assisi meeting, meeting with all the uh, religious leaders of the world for a prayer for peace in Assisi for the 27th of October. And the Archbishop saw in this event, in this announcement, in this event, an attack against the first commandment of God, thou shalt only worship one God, recognize, adore one God, and against the first article of our creed, credo in unum deum, I believe in one God. And this God is the God of the uh, revelation, is the uh, Holy Trinity, because there is no other God. And so the Archbishop began to criticize, to attack publicly in sermons, this new orientation in the Pope himself, saying more or less what St. Paul has said to St. Peter in Antioch. You are not walking upright to the truth of the gospel, uprightly to the truth of the gospel. He attacked very, very uh, severely and he said, well, it is quite possible that one day these popes, are the Pope of, especially the Pope of Assisi, they are judged by the church and they are declared that they have favored heresy, that they are condemned. In, so when he sees, saw all this, he uh, had no hope that in a near future, the Roman authorities would return to sound tradition. That is why in 1988, he consecrated the four bishops. These four bishops, whom he consecrated as auxiliar bishops. That's to say, he did not give them any jurisdiction. This is only, can only be done by the Pope himself. But he wanted that these bishops give the ordination to our seminarians and give the confirmation, the sacrament of confirmation to the children of our faithful. Because, and he did this out of the case of necessity. That's to say, because in the church it is essential that the true mass is preserved, the true Catholic mass, and that this true Catholic mass only can be celebrated by priests, and that priests only can be uh, there if they are ordained by Catholic bishops. That is why we have to have some Catholic bishops. That was the, the reasoning of the Archbishop. And so the case of necessity is not on the side of the society, society is in Palestine, but it's on the side of the church, of the universal church. And so the Archbishop ordained, consecrated these four bishops. Now I come to the third uh, point of my lecture tonight, to the question, are these conciliar popes true popes? I put this question because, you know, there are here and there little groups or persons or uh, individuals in Canada, in the United States, but also in Europe, in France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, who claim that these conciliar bishops, uh, popes, are no popes at all that the see of Peter is vacant. That is why, why they are called sede vacantis. Sede vacantis. The see of Peter is vacant, is empty. The man who is sitting on the seat, they say, 
is not the Pope. Some even go so far to say it is the Antichrist. Fine. Now, I will immediately answer to the question and give then the arguments for my answer. Yes, these popes are canonically speaking true popes. And I will give you now the uh, reasons why we have to hold them to be, that they are true popes. First argument, the church is built on Peter, so our Lord has instituted it. And nobody can change it. It is what God has instituted, nobody, no, no man can change it. It's a divine institution. And our Lord has said that he built his church on Peter. That's to say that Peter is the foundation. Now, if a building has no foundation, the building uh, crashes, falls in pieces, falls together. And so there is no church thinkable without Peter, without the Pope. The church necessarily has the Pope. And this is also confirmed by the First Vatican Council who says that the, po the church till the end will have a Pope. That Peter till the end will have successors. First argument so. There is no, there, you cannot imagine a church without the Pope. And this is a divine institution. Second point. The church is Apart the fact that it's a divine institution, also a human society it is carried by men. But every human society has necessarily an authority, a head. So also the church. And this head is the bound, the, the binding element of uh, unity. If there is no authority in a, in a society, all falls in pieces. So we see it in the uh, Orthodox Church, where all these, uh, the Orthodox Church, which falls, which is separated in a lot of uh, uh, national churches in the different countries. They have no central authority. The Church has to have uh, authority. It is, and this authority, the Pope, is the causa efficiens, speaking uh, in uh, philosophical terms, the causa efficiens, the, the efficient cause, which holds together. Second reason. Third reason, the church is a visible body. Now, this question, if you have a pope or have not a pope, is very essential for us, for every Catholic. And so every devoted Catholic would certainly know the devoted faith of Catholic would certainly know if there is a Pope or is not a Pope. Now, these people who claim that there is no Pope, they do not agree among them from what moment on there is no Pope. One of them say, well, with the death of Pius XII, there is no longer any Pope. From 1958, the 9th of October 58 on, there is no longer any Pope. Others say, no, only later on, with the council, there is no longer any pope. Others say, no, with the introduction of the Novus Ordo Misse, there is no longer any pope. Others say with the Assisi meeting, or when the pope refused to be uh, crowned, and so on. So, there is no consent among them at all about the question of the date from when on, what moment on, there is no longer any pope. But this proves that there is no event so evident for every devoted Catholic that there from this moment on is no uh, Pope, there is no such a, a event, and so it did not happen. That's the conclusion. There is no such an event which shows clearly from this moment on we have no longer any Pope. The fourth point would be the following. If the Pope is not the Pope, then the uh, residential bishops are no legitimate bishops. They are bishops according to their consecration, but they have no tradition. Now, all the residential bishops in our time are appointed by Paul VI, by John Paul II, and by Benedict XVI. 
There is no longer any re as a re residential bishop. And this means that if all these residential bishops of today are no legitimate bishops, then the church has collapsed. Church has collapsed. And this means that the gates of hell have prevailed against her, against the promise of our Lord. It's against the promise of our Lord. Next argument, the fifth. If the Pope is not the Pope, all the cardinals he has appointed are no cardinals. Now, all the cardinals of our time are appointed by Paul VI, John Paul II, and now the new uh, there will be new cardinals appointed uh, in some days by Benedict XVI. Now, all these cardinals are no cardinals. Fine. We have already seen that the cardinals are the electors of the Pope, and they only are the electors of the Pope. So, who then can elect the Pope if there are no cardinals? How can we once again get a Pope? There's no possibility. There's nobody to, lead, uh, to elect a Pope. So we cannot get out of the crisis. Now, we have to draw from these two conclusions. The first conclusion is that uh, the Church is a perfect society. What does this mean? It does, this does not mean that the church, the members of the church are all perfect. No, this means that it has always the possibility to reach its aim by its own means. That's, uh, that means that the society is perfect. A family is not a perfect society. Why not? Because a family needs help from outside. The doctor and the protection of the state and what do I know? So, a family is not a perfect society, but the state is a perfect society and the church is a perfect society. And this means that the state can reach its own aim, the welfare of the citizens, by its own means. And this means for, that the church is a uh, perfect society because it can reach its uh, aim by its own means to sanctify the souls and to carry on its mission in the world, to have a pope and to, uh, to elect the pope and so this is done by the cardinals. Now, uh, the fact that the church is a perfect society is essential for its constitution. That's a dogma. It's a truth. It's a uh, church is uh, as a mystical body. It's uh, uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, perfect. It's a perfect society. Now, if the church if the cardinals, all the cardinals, are no longer any cardinals, but so the church has no longer the, the possibility to reach its, its, its aim in electing a pope. It's against this fact that the church is a perfect society. It's against the constitution of the church. That's the first conclusion. Second conclusion. See, these people, they uh, see that uh, the church... Uh, well, that uh, they see that uh, the cardinals uh, are no cardinals according to their vision of things. So, how can the church to, uh, become uh, once again a pope? Well, they, they say, the one say, we are living in the end of the times, in the apocalypse, and there the church no longer needs a pope. There are uh, uh, some of them. Others, they say, no, well, our Lord Jesus Christ himself will interfere and give us a pope. But this means that the church herself has not the means, has no longer the means to achieve its aim. So, you see how wrong is this position. Sixth argument. I think we have not the task and the mission to judge the Pope. But we have to the mission and the charge to preserve the faith, to stay Catholics. That is our, uh, uh, what we have to do, our duty. 
Prima series animini judicatur, says one of the canons in the canon law. The first seat is by nobody judged. It is God who judges the Pope, but not the faithful, neither a bishop or a cardinal, and even not a council, cannot judge the Pope. They can uh, criticize the Pope, they can correct the Pope, they can withstand the Pope to the face, as St. Paul has done towards St. Peter, but they are not his judge. Only God is the judge of the Pope. The Pope has no superior on earth. Moreover, next argument, you see that our Lord in the Gospel says that one recognizes the tree according to its fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruits, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruits. Now let us see the fruits of the Sedevacantism, and then you can judge the tree. In our time, these Sedevacantist groups have elected here and there popes themselves. And that is why today we have about 15 popes. So we have one here in Canada, Gregory the 17th of Saint Jovit. We have uh, uh, other Gregory the 17th had in Spain, in the um, Palma de Troya, near Sevilla. He died some time ago. We have uh, in the United States Michael the first, Pius the 13th who was elected by some families by telephone. <laughs> you have in France, Peter II. In England, Linus II. And certainly there are still and other, uh, quite a lot others around. So, who is the true Pope? To what Pope should I, what, what, what uh, Pope should I put in the canon of my mass? So, moreover, these groups, they fight one another. They do not agree at all. So, for example, in Cincinnati in the United States, in the state of Ohio, there are two Sedevacantist groups. And the one group refuses the sacrament to the other group. So they have practically excommunicated the others. <laughs> Moreover, I think that the liberal mentality of these conciliar popes explains completely and sufficiently the drama which we are going through in our days. But if this explains completely and perfectly the drama, then we have not to look for other solutions and other uh, further explanations. Archbishop Lefebvre, in his uh, sermon for the uh, priestly ordinations in Econ 1982, made a very enlightening comparison between our Lord Jesus Christ and his passion on the one side and the passion of the church on the other side. And he said the following. Our Lord, God, made man, died on a cross. And this was to certain souls a scandal. How is it possible that God himself goes through such a humiliation? That they spit on him, that they crucify him, that they humiliate him, and they say, this cannot be. And so they say, he has, he was not God. These are the Arians. First false solution. And the others say, yes, we see all this, uh, what is going on, but we must admit that he has declared himself to be God. He has proved this by miracles. And so we cannot deny that he is God. But what about so this suffering and this humiliation? This can only be in appearance. This cannot be in reality. They deny the humanity of Jesus Christ. They say this is only an appearance. It appears to us it is not real. These are the docates 
and the Manichaeans who denied the divinity, uh, the uh, humanity of Jesus Christ. And the Archbishop now makes the application to the church and says, in the time of Pius XII, nobody would have thought that it is possible that the church goes through such a crisis, through such a decline of the faith, through such a, uh, such a uh, uh, terrible tragedy. But we see the fact. And we see also that these bad uh, orientations come from Rome himself and that the popes contribute to this. And so the people are scandalized. And so one part of the people, they say, this cannot be. So the popes cannot be the pope. Impossible. Others say, well, we cannot deny that these things come from Rome. And the popes are always the popes. And the popes are infallible. We know this very well. And so the conclusion is that these things cannot be bad. They are only in appearance bad. As our Lord, says the Amanikians, only had in appearance suffered on a cross. It was not reality. And so these things appear to us to be bad. In reality, they must be good because they come the, for, from the Pope. And so these people, these are the society, St. Uh, Peter and the uh, other Iglesia, uh, the other uh, uh, um, communities of Ecclesia Dei, who, uh, who do not want to attack the, uh, the council, who do not to see reality, and they swallow the poison. They swallow the poison. What is the attitude of the Archbishop? He says, on the one side, we have to preserve the faith and to refuse the errors at any cost. On the other side, we have to be faithful and attached to the see of Peter, even if there it is occupied by popes who are not very good, who have a hairs of the weaknesses of Peter. And so he says, neither modernist or liberal on the other one side, nor schismatic on the other side, but Catholic, Roman Catholic. And he says, our way is like a narrow path on a high mountain, on the summit of a mountain, with an abyss on the one side and an abyss on the other side. It is very easy to say the Pope is not the Pope. You see all these bad things, this cannot be, so the Pope is not the Pope. On the other side, it is very easy to say, since these things come from Rome, so we have to accept them. No, there's the Archbishop. We have to refuse what is poison, have to hold to the, uh, to the uh, truth and to the tradition of the church, but we have on the, uh, we have on the other side be faithful to the, uh, and attached to the sea of Peter, to Rome, the eternal Rome. And it seems that Rome, step by step, in very little, little steps, well, recognizes slowly that our way is the true one. In the audience, our superior general, Bishop Fellain, uh, had the tw uh, 29th of August with Benedict the 16th, the Pope himself spoke about Archbishop Lefebvre as this venerable Archbishop Lefebvre, this venerable Archbishop Lefebvre, and he called him a man of the universal church. This is a very high praise. Now, I come to the fourth point, conclusions, expectations, the situation today. I think that the present Pope, Benedict XVI, is unfortunately uh, still a very convinced man of the Second Vatican Council. So he proved himself in the audience the 29th of uh, August, so he proved him tell, uh, himself till more in the address he gave to the Roman Curia the 22nd of December, just some days before Christmas. And he says that the solution of uh, 
our time is to give a, 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 the right interpretation for the counts, to understand the counts in the right way. And this is, he says, to understand it according to the intention of the council fathers and to the decrees itself. And one key document, he says, in this is religious liberty. Religious liberty. And he defends religious liberty very strongly. Now, in this point, my dear friends, we cannot agree with him, unfortunately. There are two major difficulties in our uh, agreement with Rome. First of all, religious liberty. Secondly, the ecumenism as it is practiced in our days. We cannot agree with all these meetings with the different uh, uh, religious leaders. And we ask the Pope, very holy father, you want to be the successor of Peter. You are the successor of Peter, certainly. But you must show yourself to be the successor of St. Peter. Now, St. Peter, the day of Pentecost, when after the coming of the Holy Ghost, the Jews were gathered around the cynical, had a very long sermon hold to these Jews, which brought them to the contrition. And so they asked the apostles, and especially St. Peter, what have we to do, brethren, in order to be saved? And St. Peter says, well, if you want to be saved, you have to do three things. You have to repent your sins, convert yourself, first point. Secondly, you have to believe in Jesus Christ and his divinity. And thirdly, you have to be baptized. Otherwise, no salvation. Very Holy Father, if when you meet these religious leaders, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, uh, Buddhists, whatsoever, it would be very good to tell them this. My dear friends, if you want to be saved, three conditions. Repent your sins, believe in Jesus Christ, and make yourself baptized. Otherwise, no salvation. I'd be, I'm quite sure that the uh, ecumenical meetings would come very uh, soon to a stop. <laughs> now, it seems to us that uh, the present situation of the Pope is a little bit comp uh, in comparison with St. Peter. St. Peter, who uh, was put to prison by the King Herod after this one had killed John the Baptist and had killed James the first of the Apostles. And he also wanted to kill Peter, so he put him to prison. And then it was said in the Holy Scripture that the whole time the Church, the Universal Church, was praying unceasingly for him. And so Peter was freed from the prison in the night by an angel. And so he escaped to the hand of a road. It seems to me that also the council popes, and including Benedict the Sixteenth, are like in a spiritual prison, in the prison of this uh, conciliar ideology. And that the universal church has to pray for him, that he might be freed by an angel. I do not know who would be this angel, but certainly uh, he must be freed. We also have the, uh, the idea that this pope is more or less a pope of transition. He will not be, certainly not be, the great pope of the reform, which is so necessary for the church. And this by four reasons. First of all, because he himself is filled up with the modern ideas. Secondly, because he is not a man of government. He is not the tough leader. He is a man of arts, a very kind person, well cultivated. But he is not the one who really pushes through a reform. Third point, third reason, is that the present Pope, well, if, if you suppose that he wants to bring a reform, will meet a lot of resistance, a lot of obstacles, because all the key positions in the church are occupied by liberal forces, 
and they do all to make void a reform. They do not accept this. And the fourth reason would be that if you want to make a reform in the church, you have to have the people to do this on the spot, in the dioceses, in the different countries. But where are these people? Where are the great theologians? Where are the strong bishops? Where are the holy cardinals? We do not see them today. So it is impossible. It's really impossible. The Pope has not the men to bring up reform. It's impossible. Nevertheless, I think there we can expect two points from him. First point, that he gives a certain consideration to the liturgy. He is very unsatisfied with the state of the liturgy today. He has expressed this in numerous articles, books, letters. And certainly he would be ready to give at least a certain freedom to the old traditional mass. And this would already be an enormous step because it would change the climate in the church. It would not be the ultimate solution, but it would help to bring the ultimate solution. So there are rumors going around. Rumors can be right, rumors can be wrong, can be false. There are rumors going wrong that he would be ready to give at least the old mass free for the private celebration. Second point, we could perhaps expect the one or the other good appointment which he makes, perhaps even among bad appointments. I think that to appoint Archbishop Levada as the head of the Congregation of the Faith was of the second sort. <laughs> So, once again, a lot of prayer is needed because the welfare of the church almost exclusively depends on the Pope. A good Pope brings a true reform. A true uh, good Pope is an enormous blessing for the church and for the salvation of the souls. A liberal Pope, a weak Pope, or a bad Pope, well, is a uh, chastisement for the church. Now till the question, why are we going to Rome? Why are we speaking with cardinals? Why we, uh, uh, do we discuss? Bishop Fillet was the 15th of uh, November in Rome, spoke several hours with Cardinal uh, Castelnoyos. Why those meetings? Because on the one side we want to give witness of the tradition of the church, we want to show that there is only one way out of the crisis. That is the solution which Archbishop Lefebvre himself has showed by his own life, by his teaching, and by what he has founded. There is no other solution. So, on the one side and on the other side, we want to convince these people to return to sound tradition. We want also to be missionaries towards these uh, members of the hierarchy. And these efforts certainly bear the one or the other fruit. So, for example, Cardinal Castin Hoyos in Trenta Chorni, which is a bulletin given out in uh, Italian language, but also in uh, English, 30 days is the title in English, in French, in German, in the issue of uh, the month of October last year, said that the consecration of the bishops done by Archbishop Lefebvre does not constitute a formal schisma. So there is no schisma at all, contrary to what they have pretended during years. Well, we always knew that there is no schisma, but it is good to hear this from the mouth of Rome itself. Also, he said, that the society St. Pius X, contrary to all the rumors, is not out of the church. Well, if it is not out of the church, it is in the church. Once again, that is, uh, we almost knew this, that we are not out of the church, that we are in the church. 
But once again, it's good to hear this from the mouth of a cardinal. So, I think, my dear friends, our task altogether is to work, to pray, to make sacrifices, to spend now this uh, Lent time, as really a time of penance and of interior renewal, for the restoration of the Church. Canal Stickler, who was the librarian during years in Rome, told one day to me, there is no question that one day the Second Vatican Council has to be reviewed, there has to be a revision of the Council. He saw it very clearly. And this is what we are working for. We want to re-establish, according to our, fa uh, our means and possibilities, which are, uh, which are very weak, a little Christianity, gathering the families around our altars, establishing schools, Catholic schools. We want, according to our weak uh, possibilities, be in friendship with young religious communities, monasteries, uh, convents. There are about 30 uh, communities, religious communities, in friendship with us, who go the same word, uh, the same way. We want to form our priests, our young seminarians, to be true priests. We are working for parishes. We are working for a Christian society. We are working for the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our only honor and our only aim. We have no other. We have no personal interests. This is what we are doing. This is what we want. We do not know if we see the fruits of all these efforts and labors. But this is not the important point. The important point is that we do our duty and that we use the given circumstances of our days as the framer for our sanctification and finally for our salvation. We must save us in this situation and not dream of another situation. God has put it in this concrete situation put us in this concrete situation. I mentioned in my conference that uh, Pope Gregory VII withstood the German Emperor Henry IV in the question of the investiture of the bishops. And uh, first of all, the uh, Pope excommunicated the Emperor. The Emperor repented and the Pope absolved him. He went to Canossa, and uh, there he received, even from the hands of the Pope himself, Holy Communion. But then he returned to Germany and began to fall back. And he re once again re instituted the, the uh, bishops. And the Pope once again excommunicated him. And Henry IV went with an army over the arms and uh, drove out of Rome the Pope who had to go to exile and who died in exile. He did not see the fruits of all his labors, of all his uh, sufferings, but by his courageous action he, he won the liberty for the church. Afterwards the church got its liberty. He died with these words on his lips. I have loved justice and I have hated injustice. That is why I die in exile. Thank you very much.